Yes, please. Okay, yeah. good. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we are very happy to have Professor Arvind Ramanathan from Instant Bangalore uh, as our colloquium speaker today. Um, uh, Arvind is the head of research and faculty uh, in INSTEM, uh, and his research interest, as his talk suggests, is basically uh, microscopics of aging in living organisms and understanding various uh, aspects of the, uh, this very important problem. So Arvind has um, uh, done his MSc in uh, IIT Mumbai and then a PhD in chemistry from New York University. And then he was a research scientist at the Broad Institute at uh, Harvard and MIT, uh, where he uh, was interested in studying uh, the metabolic basis of cancer. And he um, uh, has uh, been the principal investigator of the Burke Institute of uh, Aging. And as he would be talking today about the aging program and various aspects of it. Uh, so over to you, Arvind. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, just uh, while Arvind shares the screen, as uh, uh, all of you know by now, you just mute yourself uh, while, uh, during the talk. And if you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask the question. But otherwise, please keep yourself muted to reduce the background noise. OK, so with that, Arvind, please. Uh, start. Fantastic. Uh, I want to thank all of you for giving me a chance to speak with such an audience. Usually, I do not, I mean, I, I would love to think about the theoretical aspects of these problems. So I'm excited to share some of my thoughts here. And I must say that a few months ago, when I met Rajesh at InSTEM, uh, along with science, we started connecting a lot about the, some of the science-based comic books and things which I had written. Uh, so I kind of moonlight as a comic book artist as well. So just based on that, I'm going to give you a slightly unusual talk. Uh, I was telling Rajesh that I was trying to write this comic book, if you will, on aging biology. So I have certain panels from that. And, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you some basic uh, a primer on aging biology alongside, of course, I thought it'd be remiss if I did not tell you the kind of things that my lab does and the kind of questions that we're asking. So it's like a half primer on aging biology and uh, can open to all kinds of questions uh, that I'd be happy to answer. And then I'll give you a quick summary of the kind of questions that we ask and some results from my laboratory. OK, so my lab works on aging in a very broadest sense. And I'll give you an example of that uh, as we move forward. Uh, and uh, I'm very fond of skeletal muscle and uh, skeletal muscle loss is like a major paradigm by which we're trying to study muscle mass. And we'll go a little more over that. Okay. So essentially, like I said, the first part, I'm going to give you like a, if you will, a graphical primer of aging biology. This is uh, based on some of a uh, little bit of work that I'm doing. Uh, writing this little book. So it's a really nice opportunity for me to show you some of my artwork and talk to you in that context about aging biology. And second, I'm going to tell you about what my lab does at InSTEM uh, in terms of skeletal muscle homeostasis, okay? So stop me at any point uh, and we can always talk a little more about it. So let me get to the first part of the talk. The first part of the talk is what, as you can tell, is a, a graphical primer of aging biology. I, have, I mean, I like many people, I've been very fascinated by this phenomenon of aging and it's with all of us and we'll go a little more into uh, details of it. But as this artwork suggests, you know, there is essentially a, a, a continuum from when you're born to when you age and there's a real understanding of, as I will tell you about what role our genome plays and where things are going to go and the role of what you eat and what you breathe. So that's a real understanding now, I think, in terms of how the systems around us influence this fundamental process of aging. So let me go to the, hold on. Uh, yes. So I, I always like looking at this uh, uh, in, in a historical context, what's happened to our, as far as the data that we have today, what's our life expectancy looking like? So as you can tell, um, most of our human race uh, have maybe had a maximum life expectancy. Life expectancy here is the average uh, life uh, of, uh, of a human being. And you can tell over the centuries how things have changed. We essentially had a maximum life, average lifespan, if you will, of uh, 35 years, if you were lucky. Uh, and then something suddenly happens. And that, I think, is a revolution in our understanding of communicable diseases, especially infectious diseases. And as you can tell, there is this inflection point. Let me find uh, my pointer. Can you see my uh, pointer, my arrow? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll just use that as my point. 
So as you can tell, an inflection point happens here where uh, great Alexander Fleming uh, in 1922 discovers the first antibiotic, penicillin. And that in many ways, I think, led to a real revolution that we no longer had to be victims of the microbes around us and that, that we had actual tools which kept progressing in terms of how what lifespan could increase. So you can tell now that since the early 20th century up to recent, up to now, in many parts of Europe and America, the average lifespan is way more than 70. And the other continents are beginning to catch up. Uh, in, even in, uh, in Asia, for instance, uh, Japan has one of the longest uh, lifespan expectancies. And I will talk a little bit about that. So that is interesting, isn't it? So we had one inflection after which there was a very rapid rise in average life expectancy over uh, every decade. And now there is a renewed notion that all this work that's been happening over the past 20, 30 years in our understanding and engineering of the genome, bioengineering, and everything, uh, new insights that we have about nutrient sensing, signaling, and so on, which I'll talk a little bit about, that we might be on a cusp of something special happening right now, very much like maybe what we had in the 20th century. We don't know if that's going to happen, but let us look at a few things that are moving us in that direction. So it's worth highlighting. I mean, this is something I have always uh, believed in, and this is a slide I used to use when I was at the Buck Institute before I moved to INSTEM, that aging is the strongest risk factor for all age-related diseases. As you can tell, usually everything is going fine until you are maybe mid-40s, uh, in your 40s, and then suddenly the risk of many, many diseases increases. And this is agnostic. It could be uh, heart disease, cancer, uh, many neurological diseases, Alzheimer's, and so on. These start increasing dramatically, exponentially, as you can tell in the y-axis, as you start aging. So there is this notion that, yes, you can treat specific diseases, try to understand how cancer works, how heart disease works, how Alzheimer's works, and there is great merit to that. But there is something underlying all of these diseases that suddenly seems to perpetuate these diseases as you get older. And the, the concept is that if we really get to understand the fundamental mechanisms by which organisms age, we might be able to, in a uh, more systematic fashion, be able to address a number of these diseases. So, as uh, the great uh, naturalist E.O. Wilson, e. Wilson had once said, essentially, that if you want to understand what human beings are and how our biology works, it's best to work to really try to understand how things work in nature, because we evolve, evolve from that. That's an obvious thing. So let us ask these. So these are all panels from my uh, book at this point, uh, which I hope you enjoy. <laughs> and so the, so let's see what we understand from nature. So I love looking at uh, images like this. Uh, lifespans vary dramatically across the animal kingdom. You can, we will talk a little more about flies and worms going on. You have mice, which live for about a few years. You have squirrels, and you have all of these cats and dogs and all of these things. And suddenly, you start seeing these animals live longer and longer. You have like this blue whale, essentially, that lives about, I mean, we don't even know really, but the oldest blue whale, I think, uh, probably is around 70 or 80 years old. And you have human beings, and you have these incredible bald eagles and all of that that are known to live close to 100 years old. Then, of course, as you all know, there are these massive uh, these, uh, tortoises. And then you have the uh, bowhead whale. Uh, nobody really knows how long a bowhead whale lives. But I recall when I was in California, they, something had beached on the uh, one of the uh, something one of the whales had beached where they found all of these spears and all of that from about 200 years ago or so. So we really don't know how long these mammals live, but they live more than 150 years old. And of course, then, as you have heard from numerous papers and maybe even talks that you might have heard, there are organisms that are essentially immortal, like the jellyfish and the planaria, which a couple of people at InSTEM work, the hydra and so on, which for all practical purposes are constantly generating and are able to live. That's, so that's remarkable that nature has essentially decided to have animals that live from a few days right up to you know hundreds of years to being immortal. And we are not the only ones. And there have been numerous people who have wondered what governs this? Why, how did nature, how does evolution decide on the lifespan of organisms? Let's not go too far into these details, but 
there is a notion that look as you increase your body mass your lifespan increases and that is true in this graph that essentially you have larger animals like elephants and uh, these large uh, bears and so on that live very long and uh, the smaller animals like mice and cats etc don't live that long so maybe this is about essentially body mass and uh, basic physiology that's happening but that's not necessarily true right because you have numerous dogs like these big uh, i forget saint bernard and then you have the chihuahuas which complete which saint bernards don't live very long they live about 7 to 8 years i believe and chihuahuas are known to live 15 or 20 years so even within the same species you know there is a huge variation which doesn't necessarily obey this rule and more interestingly uh, there has been some very interesting well the the obvious thing you see from this graph is that you have body mass but there are animals like bats and and uh, parrots and eagles and so on which live way past way beyond what their body mass would predict so clearly it isn't just about body mass and there was this very beautiful work that was done by professor steve ostad at the uh, university of alabama about 20 30 years ago but we looked at these opossums that had individually evolved in an island and then in the mainland and he found that the ones on the island generally had a very very uh, about 20 to 30% increased uh, average lifespan which told you that it wasn't just the physiology but the environment and the exposure to predators and so on uh, he a really seminal piece of work which told some, about the effect of predators and environment on regulation of lifespan so the answer and the the answer to this question is not very simple uh, there is no obvious thing that jumps out at me and now you have uh, even with like uh, as uh, many of our aging biologists we love studying this is a naked mole rat naked mole rat can live about 40 years or so and the same rodent which is essentially a rat and so on they essentially live only a few years so it's remarkable that within the same species you have this huge increase in uh yes huge increase in life span even among mammals and we won't go in too much into that there's a huge amount of excitement to understand what is it about these naked mole rats that makes them so resilient compared to rats and uh, there is this compound called hyaluronic acid which they secrete a lot which is supposed to have anti cancer effects and numerous other things uh, there's this is a field unto it, itself also there's a couple of colleagues of mine who are studying this very interesting problem right essentially from the same egg it's the same egg essentially a clonal a uh, bunch of eggs all you do is feed them royal jelly and you essentially have a female queen who grows out of that can live up to 50 months whereas a female worker lives you know a drone essentially lives just 2 months so this is really really interesting that genetically they are but they are essentially you can be identical but all you have to do is feed during a certain stages in development to feed these royal jelly and so on and you can take the same genetically identical egg and now make it live 50 months instead of just 2 months so this is again quite remarkable and all of these different uh, models to study in terms of what regulates aging what governs lifespan so then essentially we th we think of it i mean the, the the answers are here some of the answers are here now but just in historically people have been wondering maybe aging is just basic accumulation of damage ross and you'll hear all of these sorts of things like wear and tear and some people have argued that this isn't just wear and tear and so on this is actually a genetically regulated program by the genetic code it could have been either of these and now i'm going to tell you the seminal experiment that helped us understand which of these it was and this is it's worth mentioning that of course uh, lifespan is very hard to study you just can't accelerate time but uh, most of the lifespan studies i think the real hero of this is the c elegans which many of you know has numerous stages of its life and there is a decision made in the l1 stage which allows it to go into a kind of a suspended animation a, called a dower state and this animal has been extremely uh, useful in terms of uh, understanding uh, what i'm going to tell you next in terms of genetic programs that regulate aging um i i'm not sure how many of you have actually uh, either seen experiments or done experiments with c elegans but these are these are um, by professor brenner who essentially made Uh, this into the bona fide model system that it is just a simple 1 mm long worm that lives at just a few weeks and uh, has a very limited sort of a 
uh, only 20,000 proteins or so uh, encoding this gene in the genome. And it can be very easily genetically manipulated to try to understand. Okay, so these systems have been existing for a long time. So what happened? I think the seminal experiment that really, I remember I wasn't in grad school at that point. I was just in college or so. And I remember this buzz about this paper. And then since, of course, this has gone a long way, I think people were skeptical of this experiment and what it meant. But I think it's really a remarkable experiment where uh, Professor Cynthia Kenyon and Tom Johnson also at the same time discovered the similar gene. But what they did was essentially they took these C. elegans um, and they did a random mutagenesis, ENU mutagenesis, and they found single gene mutations and they screened, uh, screened genes that might have an effect on health span and uh, lifespan. And I think it was a very brave experiment because of numerous news naysayers uh, because there was never a gene that had been found where generally the worms live up to like 20 something days. The knockout of this one gene called DAF2 essentially dramatically almost tripled the lifespan of these worms. And that was quite a remarkable observation. I think a seminal experiment that told you that a single gene, if you mutated it, could dramatically increased lifespan. And later on, they also found a, another incredibly important gene I'll come to called DAF16. They did some genetic analysis where they knocked out uh, DAF2 and they found that DAF2 could have its activity in life ex lifespan extension only in a DAF16 dependent fashion. That is, if they remove DAF16, the worms would not live any longer. As you can, I don't know how many of you have looked at lifespan survival data, but it's a pretty simple but laborious sort of a thing, which has been automated at this point. But essentially, you'd have a whole bunch of graduate students uh, you know, propagating these worms and poking them to see if they were still alive or they were dead. So it is manually scored, uh, but it's very standard reproducible type of experiments. So this was the seminal experiment in, my, in, uh, in, in this field, which essentially said that lifespan might be regulated on a genetic basis. OK, so how do you know? A worm has aged and all of that. So I won't show you real experimental data, but uh, this is a very, very well-established field where there are numerous biomarkers that you can take a simple worm and you will know what are the um, things to look for in terms of its aging. There are molecular level changes, there are cellular level changes, there are tissue level changes. And this figure just tells you how, uh, what happens progressively when a, um, worm ages. And uh, as you can tell, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, these sorts of older cells which have high mitochondrial damage, high ROS, uh, increase in nuclear size, and so on on a cellular level. But uh, also in terms of movement and muscle homeostasis and all of these things, very much, I would say, remarkably like uh, mammalian, more advanced systems, does go down the same road, essentially, in terms of loss of homeostasis as it ages. So then I told you that there was this incredible gene called uh, DAF2, and that um, this DAF2 was uh, dependent on this gene called DAF16. So there was this very rapid hunt uh, between numerous labs at Harvard and MIT, uh, which were, and of course, other places like University of Washington, St. Louis, certainly UCSF, which were hunting for what this gene actually was. And uh, credit for this goes to Professor Gary Rufkin, who was at the Mass General Hospital at this point, where they did some very nice experiments and they found that DAF2 was very much like an IGF1 receptor. And that again, I'll come to the next few slides. It is quite remarkable to me that these kinds of basic insights from worms translate so nicely to higher organisms, but let's see. We all know what IGF1 is, insulin-like growth factor, uh, you know, the receptor for that. Insulin growth factor is essentially secreted by your liver. When you have a whole bunch of sugar and you've eaten all these very nice things that needs to be digested, liver essentially secretes this uh, hormone called IGF-1. And IGF-1 now binds to its receptors in other organs like fat and muscle and so on. And it helps you to take up the glucose and to digest it. So what Gary had found was this amazing fact that a very conserved gene that was a receptor of IGF-1, which was called DAF-16. And he, of course, uh, did uh, some uh, homology analysis of uh, these uh, genes to find what it was. And he later on found that was uh, DAF-2, DAF sorry. And then the, the, the gene DAF-16 that DAF-2 was responsible for 
that he did some more of these uh, genomics analyses and conservation analyses and found that TAP16 was actually this conserved transcription factor called the fork head like receptor, a uh, fork head like transcription factor. So I think these two papers, these two discoveries really blew the door open, which we are still uh, benefiting from. That number one, there are these insulin signaling based pathways, and there are specific conserved genes in there that if you mutate, you can increase lifespan. And that we also know, have some knowledge of transcription factors that mediate the signal from the insulin at growth factor to mediate the lifespan effects. So now, uh, fast forward, you know, decades of work, it is, I think, really quite remarkable that I participated in this genomic study where you know that there are these, let's call these, I think they're called the blue zones. Essentially, there are like about five places on this planet that we know of where average lifespan is 100. Loma Linda, California, there's a place in Costa Rica, Sardinia, in Greece, in Okinawa, where the average lifespan is about 100. And people have always wondered what's going on there. To cut a long story short, um, essentially this figure that I'm showing you, what IGF-1 does, and then I'm going to come to one of my favorite proteins called TORC1. Essentially, people have tried in a threadbare way to understand what this gene does. Essentially, what we know now after decades of work, and this is such a simplified version of it, is that IGF-1 hormone essentially take, goes to the muscle and essentially helps muscle and may, maybe even many proliferative cells to metabolize glucose and to decide what kind of genes to transcribe in response to this uh, nutrient uh, signal, uh, which also involves how much protein to make, to make RNA, to regulate protein turnover, autophagy. So essentially, IGF-1 sets into motion this very conserved and important PI3K mTOR pathway that helps tissues and animals regulate how they process nutrients. Why am I bringing that up is that this genomic study that was done by centenarians, I think this was done by centenarians in Italy, and I think it has also replicated in a couple of other centenarian studies, was that if they looked for genes that were uh, conserved, which had a mutation that would, uh, compared to short-lived human beings, if you compare them to long-lived human beings and you look for mutations in their genes, remarkably, the gene that really comes out in a big way is the IGF-1, IGF-1 receptor. Uh, it still blows my mind that uh, I would have never expected a discovery from a small worm that told you something about IGF-1R to suddenly replicate in a human uh, study, you know, uh, 30, 40 years from then. But what I want to drive home is that one of the pathways and genes, which I believe regulates lifespan, comes from how we process glucose. And if you have, I don't understand the mechanistic, no, I don't think anybody understands the mechanistic reason behind these, but centenarians from these uh, very long lived human cohorts have a low circulating level of IGF-1. Either saying that they don't need IGF-1 very much or that the IGF-1 receptor is, uh, is essentially this mutant, as you can tell, uh, the R407H, if you treat cells with IGF-1, it does not respond very much to IGF-1, saying that it's insensitive to IGF-1. So I don't know mechanistically what this implies, but so far it seems like many of the mutations essentially do not allow you to respond to the IGF-1 hormone. And what that means is still being figured out. Let me move so, to uh, my favorite. Uh, are, yeah, uh, please. Can I, uh, uh, you don't mind taking questions? No, please. Uh, uh, no, uh, so thanks. Um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, I was wondering whether you, can you disentangle this uh, low level of IGF-1 circulating amongst these uh, centenarians from say other external factors like their diet or something like that? Uh, or is, the, is this a kind of a, two-way process, meaning that uh, uh, maybe you will touch on this, uh, uh, that it's a combination of uh, it what... It is a combination, but that is a genetic factor. I mean, it, this is inherited by children, even if they don't have the same lifestyle. They might not live up to 100. And as you can tell, this is a mutation that is inherited. And this mutation seems to be sufficient when you express it to give you these... But clearly, 
what okay. happens in Greece and Italy and so on has to do with all the diet and that that's, I think plays a massive role, social mm -hmm. role and so on. But the remarkable thing is there is also a genetic component that can be inherited. Can be inherited and you take the people from the same uh, 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 culture. Now they have uh, done their children and yeah. they also live long. Yeah. Okay. And they have yeah. this yeah. Okay. Great. Like and as you can tell, these studies go very short. Neil Barzila, I just discovered this in 2008. The cohort study of the children just came out two years ago. So it's like I have to say that these this is this is what we know so far. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So that brings I, I, I alluded to this protein called mTOR, and this has I just want to give you a flavor. Uh, I mean, if I was in person, I could have I would have known how many of you are familiar with this. So I don't know how deep or shallow to go. But this mammalian target of rapamycin, I think, has really played a tremendous role in aging biology. And I always like to illustrate this in terms of such an um, unusual way of discovering biology. You know, that the, the person who found rapamycin, who found his country, Dr. Suren Segal, he's known as father of rapamycin. It's not like he went and tried to look for an inhibitor of this important protein. But as many of you know, this famous story that there was an expedition to the Rapa Nui Island by the uh, Royal Navy vessel that collected some soil. And from there, after like a couple of decades, you had this uh, incredible scientist find the structure of this molecule. And they would have thought it's just a simple antifungal, but this has gone a really long way. As you can tell, it's, I mean, you could have, there are hundreds of laboratories working on this molecule and what it does. But let me just give you a very short flavor. What rapamycin does is that I showed you the signal, right, where you have IGF-1 that activates this pathway. What rapamycin does in some way, I don't think it really mimics IGF-1, sort of a longevity uh, phenotype, but what it actually does is the downstream protein mTORC1 is very specifically inhibited by rapamycin. And a lot of uh, people, including the laboratory I worked with for my postdoctoral fellowship, spent many, many, many years elucidating how this protein actually does so. We won't go into the details of it. And it's a very complex field. But essentially what rapamycin is, is it's a small molecule dimerizer. Essentially, the protein, uh, it, I mean, it's interesting, the mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. So you discovered the protein by virtue of finding this molecule. So essentially, now it's called the mammalian target of rapamycin. And what that does is that it, uh, it, the molecule rapamycin has two domains that brings together two proteins, uh, mTOR uh, and FKPP12, and thereby essentially brings another molecule close to rapamycin, dimerizing it, thereby inhibiting its kinase function. So we know what the target of rapamycin is, and it's a really complicated field, and I don't have time to uh, go into the details of it today. But let me just take one, give you one thought of what that is. Rapamycin, or the rapamycin sensing protein, the mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin, essentially you could call is the master nutrient sensor. mTOR is this final integrating signal that tells you whether you have enough nutrients or not. So essentially what rapamycin does is that it tells the cell, it fools the cell into thinking it's starving. So if you have all these PR3 kinase and uh, protein expressions and proliferations and so on that are happening because there's a lot of glucose and insulin in the media, if you add rapamycin, it short circuits the entire process and now the cell even though all these nutrients are present, essentially functions in a way that it thinks it's starving. So essentially uh, what, by virtue of this small molecule people had discovered was the master nutrient sensor. And a lot of people had instead of including Sunil, you might have heard and so on, actually spend a lot of time understanding the protein mTOR and how it does its signaling. So we won't go deep into that. But essentially why am I bringing that up is that this is the other molecule that has really caused a great deal of interest in the aging field. And this is also quite remarkable. People had, uh, it was, its effects on uh, replicative, uh, essentially lifespan of yeast was discovered in uh, by David Sinclair and Lenny Granti and so on. Uh, and they have found other mechanisms you won't go into. But what has happened in the since then is that people have found that rapamycin is able to increase lifespan, I mean, essentially by giving the organism a starvation phenotype is now able to increase 
the lifespan of numerous animals. It's been studied in dogs. It increases lifespan by 20% in worms, in flies. And recently there was a paper in 2016 by Matt Caberlion, et cetera, who essentially treated mice with rapamycin uh, three months into their uh, life, which is, we would call a middle age or so. And it increased maximum lifespan of these mice by 60%. So now let us not uh, um, essentially make rap what rapamycin does simpler than it is. It affects numerous types of cells, including the immune cells and so on. But essentially in all of these cells, it creates a starvation phenotype and somehow the starvation phenotype, uh, starvation signaling, if you will, is able to increase lifespan, which again brings me to the next big thing you would have heard of, which is caloric restriction. So people have been thinking, okay, so if this sort of a starvation phenotype is uh, responsible of increase for increasing uh, lifespan, what happens to animals who are given a lot less calories? So essentially you would have seen that now if you give uh, animals more than about 25 or 30 percent of their daily calories. Now, this is still a, um, I mean, people who know metabolism will ask more important detailed questions like what are these calories comprised of? Are they carbohydrates? Are they proteins? And so on. There's lots of answers to that. But if you decrease the, the total number of calories uh, given to an animal, it seems to mimic what rapamycin and another compound called metformin, uh, which is this anti-diabetic drug does as far as inhibiting mTOR goes. And they have found that, this is a study that just came out, I think uh, about two years ago, that, uh, I mean, it was always a doubt whether this thing just, is just a phenomenon that works in mice and, uh, you know, worms and so on. Now, this is the first uh, study that was done in a higher, uh, essentially a higher mammal. Um, I forget what this mammal is called. I think they are, uh, somebody who looks at this could know this. But it's just a couple of years ago, which came out that these usually their average lifespan is about seven uh, years or so. And by giving them a caloric restriction diet, you could increase their lifespan, average lifespan to about nine years or so, which is quite remarkable. So I think this is where the field is at, where it's trying finally some sort of a pattern is emerging in terms of mTOR signaling, in terms of insulin signaling, in terms of nutrient uptake nutrient sensing, and now trying to find all the molecules that are involved in terms of transmitting these kinds of signals, which include ketone bodies, as many of you know, a uh, number of other molecules that are signaled by the liver and fat. But so where the field is at is at this point is that now knowing that uh, nutrient sensing is an important, nutrient sensing and starvation is such an important part of the lifespan phenotype, they are really dissecting out the downstream molecules, which could be targeted, which could be supplemented. And that's where most of the field is right now. Now, again, uh, I made the picture a bit more complicated at this point, but this is, I would say, not even close to our understanding at this point. We know a bit more, but I just want to put this big map that I found from this paper. They're essentially where this whole lifespan um, lifespan regulation thing is going, are, it, it, what's emerging at this point are the central players that are talking about mTOR. I haven't told you about the AMPK, which is one of those major molecules that rapamycin and other antidiabetics uh, uh, regulate. There's these compounds called resveratrol, which you have heard, which comes from uh, red grapes and so on. But the, the, um, the pattern that's emerging at this point is that there are molecules that target how cells sense nutrients, how the central nutrient sensing factor tells a cell whether it's going to make more protein or less protein, is it going to make more RNA or less RNA, and how it's going to regulate inflammation, how it's going to in, uh, influence uh, lipid biosynthesis, and numerous transcription factors downstream have been uh, discovered, including FOXO, the 4 k like transcription factor, which I just alluded to from the worms, which are also conserved in mammals. So all of that is coming together by telling us that possibly intervening in this pathway might have some positive impacts on lifespan. And things haven't just uh, stopped there. I just wanted to tell you that there's actually a clinic, I mean, people have bought this enough, I guess, that the actual clinical trials in the NIH have started where this molecule called metformin, which does something different, but very similar to what rapamycin does. And it's not very toxic. It's been taken a lot as an anti-diabetic now. So there are safety studies are very well known. There is a, 
a clinical trial that's ongoing funded by numerous other foundations as well, uh, apart from some NIH grant that are testing whether modulating this pathway can actually influence age-related diseases and maybe even improve lifespan in humans. Of course, this is going to take 10 years or more to find what happens there, but that is where the field is at. And that is this is the kind of pattern that's emerging. Um, I have a question. So, yeah. Please. Hi. Uh, it's about metformin. Uh, so, uh, you know, as you said, uh, for people who have diabetes, uh, they are treated with uh, metformin in some slow release way. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is that uh, if I take a little bit more of it, will it benefit me? Um, so, I mean, this is. I, well, first, first answer, the right answer is I don't know. Second answer is there's a lot of snake oil in the field. And because a clinical trial has started, there's actually a notion of the, the dosage that is being suggested. And uh, I think it is worth looking to the clinical trial and seeing what kind of dosage they're suggesting. It is fairly non-toxic, but I just don't know how much less or more is at this point. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, please. Uh, I have a question, which I hear. Yeah, yeah, please uh, go. Uh, no, I, I was trying to understand, uh, maybe this is a naive question. So what the molecules that you showed and the pathways that you showed are all at the single cell level. In multicellular features, yeah. won't there be regulation? No, no. Uh, yes, you're absolutely correct, but it has gone to the multicellular and physiological levels. And the question you ask is absolutely correct. Uh, which tissue is responsible and so on is still yes. under study. It yeah. seems like because the way these drugs are taken and they go to the kidney and the liver first, seems like they are the major targets. So the thought is that there's, there are signals coming from these liver and kidney that might be modulating other things. So even, in, like I said, these studies have not just been done in single cells, they've also been done in mice. And like I said, uh, um, certainly some other higher mammals. And uh, it's also true on a physiological level. Okay. Uh -huh. But the question is absolutely relevant and I think still needs a lot of study. Uh, not many people are able to say what happens to these pathways in different tissues. And as a matter of, yeah, anyway, that's an uh, opportunity for another longer discussion. So, um, Arvind, if I understand right, uh, the, uh, the, these chemicals, either rapamycin or metformin uh, and so on, uh, they, they, their intervention at the, uh, at some, uh, at a, uh, I don't know, I don't have the right terms to uh, frame it, but it, it seems that ultimately their phenomenological uh, uh, implications at uh, at the cell or the tissue level is in terms of this inflammation or suppressing. The, is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, okay. the, the molecular, it is targeting the protein mTOR. And the protein mTOR essentially regulates a sense, a sensing of glucose and insulin and relays this signal to translation and uh, protein turnover and all of that. Now, the implications of this molecular targeting has different implications in different cell type. If you target this in an inflammation, uh, inflammatory cell, like a T cell, which is where a lot of studies have been done, you're correct, inflammation does go down. Okay. If you target this in the liver, the liver no longer is able to make glucose. Mm -hmm. I see. So yes, th this pathway is present in every cell, but what it does in terms of physiological regulation depends on which cell it's being targeted to. I see. Uh, I see. Uh, and uh, and you say uh, protein synthesis when you say that's uh, that's. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, you you want to inhibit protein synthesis uh, uh, or? Yeah, I mean. So I, I, I think so I think the beneficial effects are more on the side of protein turnover and autophagy. That's where I think people are seeing the same with caloric restriction and so on. So where it has seen a lot of benefit, especially in neurological tissue and so on, is that there's usually a protein buildup that does not get recycled as you age. So the half-life of proteins start increasing. So which means they're able to accumulate more damage and all of that. So when you tell a cell that don't make any more protein, essentially the cell goes into a mode of saying, look, I need to have amino acids from somewhere. I need to turn it over to make other things. 
So it takes the old proteins that have accumulated and it starts uh, degrading them through a process called autophagy, which means self-eating. Yeah. And yes. essentially, autophagy has been shown to be regulated directly by mTOR through a couple of pathways. And autophagy seems to be the one that is beneficial in terms of the protein synthesis phenotype. I see. I see. And uh, just from a naive uh, layman, the person's point of view, uh, uh, used to hear a few years ago, not so much nowadays, about all these antioxidants and so on. Uh, uh, sort of, uh, say they don't. Uh, do no, they... and again, uh, very good question. In that, I think our knowledge of biology, I guess, understanding has become so much more sophisticated, right, in the past many years, that there is no such thing as good or bad. You need, I mean, oxidative signals, reactor oxidation species are actually required by a cell. They are important secondary messengers for, there's a physiological role for it. I think when homeostasis is lost and there's a lot more at a certain point, yes, I think they become pathological. Hmm. The balance, I don't think is clear. And antioxidants in general, they, it's not, uh, there are some very specific scenarios where they might be beneficial. And many cases where they're actually very harmful because you don't have the physiological levels of uh, oxidative signals that you need. I see. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So I thought from here, um, I'll go to, um, before I go to what I do in the lab, I thought uh, we will quickly touch upon some cellular mechanisms of aging. So all of these, you know, all of these pathways that are happening inside a cell, signaling pathways, nutrients, and so on. But then on a physiological level, what makes an organism age? And the notion, I mean, again, so there are many factors. I'm going to bring just one factor, which my lab studies, which I have some knowledge of, just which is a, that, yeah. A question before that, if you don't mind. Yes. yes. I, uh, you mentioned that uh, at some point, uh, uh, the, you, you mentioned about the liver hmm. uh, stops producing sugar. You mentioned that. Yes. Due yes. to uh, some... Uh, intake of uh, rapamycin or okay. so is that a good thing or bad thing i'm it asking very practical good. questions i'm sorry no no these are very good questions and again uh, let us get to the point where there is no good or bad it's only certain context where it's good or bad if you are a absolutely healthy person who needs where the liver makes needs to make glucose it's probably a bad idea isn't it yes but at a certain point when you, your liver has gone out of control and it's beginning to accumulate fats and so on, at that point, it will be good to, uh, so that you don't, you're not hyperglycemic, it will be good to shut it down. I see. So, so this, I, I think it is this knob, when you get from zero to 10, maybe nature loves to keep everything at four. And when it goes to about six or seven, you try to bring it down. So this and observation what, people make about uh, you know, when you go for an examination, uh, many people have what is called fatty liver. It's a right. player. Yeah. Is it related to what you're saying? Yes. I mean, fatty liver is a consequence of essentially what is fatty liver? If liver is accumulating a whole bunch of triglyceride droplets. And why is that? It's unable to take those fatty acids and mobilize them to make sugar to release so that muscle can take it up, right? This whole circuit between yes. fat and liver yes. and muscle. Yes. So fatty liver essentially says, okay, your liver has stopped doing what it physiologically does. And drugs like metformin and a few others have actually been shown to now force the liver to, because it's starving, now it's able to you know, get a signal yes. and say, okay, let's get rid of the fat. Yes. So yeah, it's always this balance and this trifecta between muscle, liver, and fat, uh, which... Uh, we are still really beginning to understand, but as somebody asked, it's the physiology, physiological loss of homeostasis that we need to restore with some of these molecules. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I, I just thought this will go a bit more into uh, the kind of things that my lab studies. Um, and that to me, I mean, to study organismal aging, I've always found to be an extremely difficult problem. But what I can understand is that there are these pathways which are conserved between different cells, which does different things in different contexts. We can study that. Second, an interesting thing that has emerged is, I mean, very simply, as you age, your cells age and these old cells accumulate. Okay. And there is a lot of interest in that. So let us, uh, let me just allude to that in my next couple of slides before I, um, I, so essentially, what happens is that 
and uh, I have some more scientific data to show you in a few uh, slides. But the idea is that as you age, your cells age, and uh, many of you know that uh, the, um, the the replicate essentially, if you take a cell from your skin and let it replicate after about ten or fifteen um, cell doublings, the cell essentially becomes old and doesn't replicate anymore. And that was discovered in the sixties by Leonard Hayflick, uh, who's actually a, still a professor of anatomy at UCSF. Um, I think he still runs a lab. But it was a back then it was one of these observations like, OK, maybe you put on some cells on the plate. People didn't quite understand it was way ahead of his time in that sense. But now what we are finding is that those same replicative senescent cells that happened in a plate actually occur within us. That over time, uh, your, your body is no longer able to turn over these old cells and these old cells essentially accumulate. And there is a real new, I would say, renewed revolution in this area of senescent cells or old cells, where we think this might be one of the targets to uh, change how the aging works. So essentially what I'm trying to show in this cartoon is that you have young cells that over time become old and essentially st stem cells can become old and you lose stem cells. You essentially have this uh, tissues like muscle, which whose cells get older, stem cells get older because of which they're unable to regenerate themselves. And maybe this, phenomenon of cells getting older, accumulating in tissues. Now you do that on a whole body level, essentially you become older and maybe that is one of the drivers of what aging is. And there is plenty of evidence to indicate that. Uh, most of you will, I'm not even going to take too much time on, on uh, telomerase and all of that. Most of you know, it's a very, very well-studied area. Uh, Pro Professor Blackburn, of course, won the Nobel Prize in 2009, where uh, there's obviously a great interest in loss of telomere length and so on with aging. But as you know, most of our body is post mitotic, as in they don't replicate very much like muscle and a lot of the liver cells and so on. So this cannot be the only answer, right? I mean, uh, it's not just about the telomere length. So essentially, I'm just uh, say Judy Campisi, one of my uh, collaborators at the Buck, is essentially one of those, I think one of those real major researchers who has brought life back to this field. And I'm going to show you some data at this point. Okay, where um, the concept is that these old cells or these senescent cells that are lying around in many parts of your, in many of your tissues are not these benign cells that are just sitting there. As a matter of fact, what these old senescent cells do is they secrete a whole lot of inflammatory and other cytokines and other proteins. And it is known that these factors that are secreted by senescent cells can actually start causing all kinds of inflammatory phenotypes, including cancer. Now, just to let you know that there is a physiological role for senescence. Nature didn't make old senescent cells or old cells for, you know, it was made for a function. And what that function is that when cells acquire a lot of DNA damage, you do not want these cells hanging around because they can become cancer. So essentially what happens is a pathway comes in where by which these proliferative cells now are taken into a senescence phenotype. And these senescence phenotype also play a very important role in wound healing. So when you're young, these senescent cells, which are turned over rapidly in the wound and so on, play a very important physiological role. But what we're talking about is this phenomenon, which is, I would say, beyond evolution, that now that we have lived long enough, that these old cells are accumulating and those which performed a physiological function when you're young now actually become toxic. And that is what we're talking about as these senescent cells or this age-based accumulating cells which we know more and more data is coming in saying that they might actually be drivers of, of aging. And how do we know this? There are new, there's a whole class of drugs coming up called senolytics. So what these drugs do is essentially they go and people have found specific pathways in senescent cells, which are called BCL2, these antipoprotic pathways and many more being found by the day, which specifically sensitize senescent cells only to die. And what's happening very recently, I mean, this, I'm just talking about data that's happened just in the past few years is that they have taken these old mice and killed these senescent cells. And essentially you can increase lifespan by 17 or 40% in some cases. So what, so my lab works on senescence and I'll show you a little bit of what we have done, but I want you to think of this concept that this mystery of why organisms age, one of the major factors could be that organisms are made up of cells and as cells age, the organism ages. And if you take out these old cells, which are secreting inflammatory and other toxic molecules, you might be able to do away with numerous diseases. And there are billions of dollars being poured into finding these analytics, 
which might be able to cure numerous aging and aging related diseases so are we on a so i, I just thought to, to show you the, i mean the, most of you know that i mean uh, essentially jeff bezos started this company for 3 billion dollars like a couple of months ago there is a uh, unity biotech there's caluco from google there are these all of these companies which are pouring in a huge amount of money looking at numerous number of these strategies and many most of these people are way brighter than i am who have been in this field for a lot longer than i have and there is a notion that indeed we are at a cusp at, at, at a certain there is a certain insight emerging that if we understand the fundamental pathways that underlie aging that drive aging be it mTOR, be it these nutrient sensing signals, be it senescent cells, that we might actually be able to slow down the clock or at least carry out healthy aging. And that's where we're at. And I think the big money is betting on uh, some many of the concepts that I talked about. And I think over the coming years, we will see, we might really be at a revolutionary point where uh, we might, uh, I won't say turn back the clock, but certainly be able to uh, slow it down in some sense. So I don't want to miss the opportunity to tell you some things about what's happening in my lab. So I have a lot of uh, um, area to cover here. But um, in the part two, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the cellular and skeletal muscle aging research that's happening in my lab. Okay. Now, first part, I'm not going to tell you a lot about. We just published this last year. But again, just to let you know that the senescent cells that I talked about, these old cells, these have been found in every tissue as people age from, they are known to play a role in neurodegenerative diseases in adipocytes in kidney cells and skeletal muscle cells and chondrocytes. There's a lot of interest in that these accumulating senescent cells and our joints and so on might be the ones which are driving uh, arthritis and so on. So it's kind of interesting, isn't it? We are suddenly not looking at uh, liver fibrosis or eye degenerative diseases or cancer or uh, arthritis. We're almost looking at all of these diseases that are maybe driven by some common cell types, which might be a therapeutic target. So essentially, we have really come to a, we're really at an evolution in terms of trying to understand senescent cells in terms of their molecular alterations and uh, their, which include mitochondrial dysfunction, loss of protein, homeostasis, epigenetic alterations, telomere alteration. So many of these things go wrong in parallel in, to form a senescent cell. And these senescent cells accumulate in different tissues. And these senescent cells might actually be driving diseases in many of these tissues. And one of the things that my lab studies is a thing called SASP, Senescence Associated Secretary, Secretary Program, if you will. So like I told you, these senescent cells that accumulate in different tissues are not these benign sort of cells. They actually secrete a lot of inflammatory cytokines. So they're just sitting there, they're protein-making factories, which are constantly uh, inflaming the tissue. And this inflammation of this tissue by sec secreted factors, which include proteins and lipids and so on, this disrupt normal stem cell function in the tissue. They might promote cancer. They might promote inflammation. So my lab is really, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but we just published this paper last year in Cell Metabolism, where we found that senescent cells are doing what they do, which is uh, toxic in terms of pro promoting inflammation by, by secreting an important uh, sec uh, lipid called 15-DPGJ2. And what we also found that was that if we treated uh, the senescent, and I won't go into the, this paper will tell you a little bit about what are the mechanisms by which these lipids uh, promote uh, senescence, which is uh, through a protein called HRAS, you've heard of P53 and so on. But I want to spend a little more time on the other problem that we work on. So we work on senescent cells and we try to understand what are the factors that are being secreted by senescent cells and how these factors change the surrounding tissue environment. So that is one of the things that we work on and that part of it has been published last year. But the other thing that my lab is very interested in is uh, the phenomenon of skeletal muscle aging in metabolic disease. Like I said, this is the second largest issue after your skin in the body. And if you have a dysfunction in skeletal muscle, it's going to cause all kinds of issues in the body and including aging. Uh, there is an age-related uh, loss of skeletal muscle homeostasis called sarcopenia. It can cause diabetes and obesity. If you, Because like I was mentioning, nutrient sensing and glucose uptake and insulin and all of that, this is where the glucose goes. When you have glucose in your body, it has to go somewhere. And skeletal muscle is this thing. It is the largest source 
for which uh, insulin signaling happens and it becomes a sink and it's made into protein. So if you have a loss of skeletal muscle mass and uh, homeostasis, you get diseases like obesity and diabetes. The, uh, one of the very interesting uh, phenomena that my lab is going to be is working on, which I'll tell you a little more about, is limb immobilization. Isn't it interesting that if any of us, we stop using our limbs, even for about 10, 15 days, you start losing skeletal muscle mass significantly. And this also happens in space flight and so on. And we are really interested in understanding the mechanisms by which a skeletal muscle decides to lose muscle mass and function because of mobilization. I won't tell you a little bit about some rare diseases, which are also like Duchenne muscular dystrophy and so on that are involved. So my lab is interested in dissecting these mechanisms, these metabolic mechanisms, which make this tissue decide that it's going to lose mass. And what is that decision point is what we're trying to understand. So essentially, if you want to change muscle homeostasis, what you have to do is uh, essentially lose uh, skeletal muscle mass. And as many of you know, muscle can atrophy if you don't use it. If you go to the gym and weight lift, you'll get uh, much uh, bigger muscles. And also, as many of you know, it isn't just muscle is composed of numerous fiber types. There are these fiber types that uh, a marathon runner has called type one fibers. They're highly mitochondrial. If you look at the, you know, um, if you look at the muscle color, even of a marathon runner, you'll see it's red. It's, uh, it's essentially taking up a lot of hemoglobin and using a lot of glucose for mitochondrial metabolism. But if you look at like a, a weightlifter, a SOMA wrestler or something, you'll see that they are a lot less red and it's a different fiber type. So we're trying to understand this phenomenon of how a tissue decides to be big or small and how it responds to different needs. And second, of course, is the other distinguishable part, which is regeneration. When your skeletal muscle is damaged, how do you, I mean, when you go to the gym and maybe you haven't worked out in a long time and your muscles are hurting a lot, a lot of it is essentially micro tears of your muscle. And you have damaged your tissue and that tissue needs to be regenerated. And how that happens is by resident adult stem cells. And my lab studies these adult stem cells. And these are just some molecular markers based on which we will know they are stem cells. They are essentially present in the basal lamina of a skeletal muscle. And as soon as you have damage, they are able to sense the damage, wake up, proliferate, and make more muscle. And we are interested in understanding both of these phenomena to modulate both of these phenomena to benefit human health. So the, this phenomenon, like I told you, of how muscles, uh, how stem cells wake up and make more muscle, uh, essentially is governed by numerous factors. One of the things is skeletal muscle metabolism. The kind of nutrients you take and the kind of nutrients that are available, oxygen and so on, have a huge impact on whether these stem cells are able to make more muscle. There is an emerging huge interest in uh, ECM signaling and mechanosensory signals. We don't study that specifically, but it is very well known that changes in mechanical signaling of these stem cells essentially govern whether they're able to proliferate or they're able to differentiate. And finally, like I said, there are numerous, as you age, there are these senescent cells that accumulate in skeletal muscle which are now able to secrete factors and change how a muscle is able to regenerate. So let me go to this one question that my lab asks, essentially is something that many of us have encountered and it, as a child, it didn't matter very much, which is, uh, uh, you know, disuse made of atrophy. If you got a fracture or something, or for whatever reason you couldn't move, after about 10, 15 days, you lose a huge amount of skeletal muscle mass. And if you start moving, it comes back again when you're a child and you recover completely, but that is not so as you age. Uh, you're, you lose skeletal muscle mass by aging, which is called sarcopenia. And on top of that, you're unable to recover that. So uh, my lab is really interested in understanding this decision process. At what point and what are the signals that essentially tell a skeletal muscle that it must atrophy? Now, if you want to atrophy, the obvious thing that must happen is proteins need to be broken down. That's what atrophy is. But what we really want to know is what are the metabolic signals that drive muscle atrophy and make it diminish in size and function. And uh, to cut a long story short, we're really coming into certain insights that this driver could actually be certain mitochondrial and metabolic signals. And the goal being that if you understand the nutrients and metabolites and these small molecule signals that drive this cascade of protein loss and atrophy, maybe we will be able to go in and reverse this process of atrophy. Uh, in that context, I mean, I would love for you to think about this interesting problem that atrophy by disuse is not necessary. There are these amazing animals in nature which don't use their muscle for six months and they do just fine. And I've given you this one example called these 13 line ground squirrels, uh, which essentially hibernate. They, six, they sleep for six months of the year. They go through these 
uh, cycles uh, over after every few weeks called torpor and arousal, essentially keeping their core temperature at about 32 degrees. And, at and they are somehow able to change their metabolism and they're able to essentially mobilize fat from tissues that are fat that they have accumulated during summer. They're able to change their core temperature in a way that they don't lose skeletal muscle mass anymore. And my lab is very fascinated by that phenomenon. Is that interesting? I mean, we are all at 37, we are warm blooded animals, like many animals on this planet. If uh, any of us decreased our core temperature to even 35 degrees or so, we would probably not survive. I don't think there is a human being who survived even up to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 34 degrees centigrade as a core temperature. But these animals stay at 32 degrees centigrade and they're able to maintain muscle mass and live for a pretty long period of time. So uh, one data I'm going to show you is what is happening? What is the secret of hibernation that allows cells to maintain mass and not to lose, especially skeletal muscle cells, to not lose muscle mass? And we are very interested in this phenomenon called hypothermic adaptation. And I would love for us to think about what hypothermia means. So you have a cell at 37, we take that for granted. When you go to a, a lower temperature, what happens? And that is what my lab is trying to understand. The signals, uh, whether we can use these sorts of hypothermic signals to prevent hypothermic adaptation. So one of the first things I'm gonna tell you a little bit in the next five, 10 minutes is that there are, so what happens when you turn down the temperature in a cell to 32 degrees centigrade, there, just like there, there are certain proteins, which we don't understand exactly how, but there are certain proteins that are transcribed or tr translated only at a low temperature. And one of them is this protein called RBM3. So uh, I know this is a little out of the wheelhouse here, um, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for the kind of experiments that we can do. And it might be a lot of fun to work with people here in terms of really trying to understand this better. But we can take muscle cells, we can grow them at normal temperature. We can put them in an incubator and grow them at 25 degrees centigrade, just like a squirrel and ask what happens. So those are the experiments that we have done where essentially we take a muscle cell, put it at, uh, at 25 degrees, at 32 degrees. And you see this increase in this one protein called RBM3. So it's that's remarkable that nature has a mechanism by which it responds to hypothermia. Uh, and that is by upregulation of certain proteins called RBM3. And we find that when you grow these muscle cells at a lower temperature, they become pretty robust. They are able to, I won't take you through this data, but you can take me, you can take my word for it. And we can always come back to the raw data here, but we're using RT-PCRs and Western blots to essentially tell you that there is something remarkable about hypothermia, that you take tissues to a lower temperature, they become, the stem cells themselves become very robust. They're able to, when you bring them back to a higher temperature now, somehow they seem to have this memory of a lower temperature and they're able to withstand uh, stresses more and they're able to differentiate and make more skeletal muscle. So we are really trying to understand what this protein is. What is so special that uh, at low temperature, this protein goes up. So again, we are trying to find the structure of this protein called RBM3 and really trying to understand the different domains of this protein. And it is essentially an RNA binding protein. Like I said, it has an RNA binding uh, motif and we really don't understand um, what RNAs it binds to, but then it has this major uh, disordered domain. And as many of you know, in this, uh, this, this new field of biology where they talk about phase separations and all of that, there is an understanding that these RBM3, these RNA binding proteins, these large disordered domains, actually at lower temperature form these different kinds of phases which might be able to uh, save or uh, bind to certain molecules like RNA that they could not at higher temperatures. You, so using structural biology and some biophysics, we're trying to understand what this protein does. But to cut a long story short, what we are happy to see is that you don't have to take cells at, the cold, at a cold temperature. You can just now um, take this cold dependent protein and overexpress it at a room at normal temperature, which normally would not happen in nature. And it's now able to mimic what happens at cold temperature, saying that in terms of how cells are able to regenerate or survive, uh, saying that, okay, whatever cold is doing, uh, this protein RBM3 might be able to recapitulate many of these effects. So essentially what we have seen then is we are trying to, let's say, at take a room temperature cell, uh, not room temperature, or 37 degree cell, we're uh, physiologically grown, and we're trying to mimic the effect of cold by overexpressing this protein and asking now, what do you do? And we see that it does all the things that you would expect um, 
expect a robust sort of a cell to do, which is it, it's resistant to uh, it is resistant to numerous uh, stresses, mitochondrial stresses. It's able to upregulate numerous genes, which are uh, mitochondrially associated genes, uh, and probably don't have time to explain how this experiment is done. But what we are seeing here is uh, oxygen consumption rates. We have instruments by which you can measure the basal oxygen consumption of cells in different conditions. And as you can tell, this orange colored line is a cell that's expressing RBM3 and the blue colored line is one that is not. And we're saying that this cold mediated protein RBM3, just by overexpressing it, is able to increase the basal oxygen consumption and basal lactate production. And there are certain molecular inhibitors we add to look at what aspects are being changed. So. If there are questions, I can go back deep into it, but essentially you have a cell that's growing and you add mit mitochondrial inhibitors, which decreases the basal oxygen consumption. You use a mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation uncoupler, which essentially tells you what the major, the full activity of mitochondria is. So from all of this, we're essentially getting some insight that these cold related proteins are able to make a cell much more metabolically efficient make a cell much more mitochondrially efficient, make much more mitochondrial metabolism. So the future, essentially, we're going to be looking, we're going to, well, this is it'd be foolish for me to say that I'm going to take a non-hibernating animal and give it uh, hibernating properties. But essentially, what we would like to know is that a, a rodent like a mouse that uh, undergoes atrophy when you don't use it, can you now give it certain properties using this RBM3 transduction and give it properties which would be only uh, beneficial to, uh, to an animal that could reduce its core temperature to 32. So those are the kind of things we're going to study is that understand how this RNA binding protein works and whether in vivo we can give it some beneficial effects. The other thing I'll very quickly tell you in uh, five minutes is we are also interested in this process of atrophy. As you know, you get into a cast uh, after two or three weeks, you lose a huge amount of skeletal muscle mass, about 15, 20%. And it's very difficult to get it back. And we, in my lab, want to dissect using transcription profiling and other methods. What is it? What is this? I'm still fascinated by this decision point that if an animal stops using its limb, it makes a decision to start getting rid of its protein and atrophy. So we are following this dynamically. At By day 10 or 14, you lose skeletal muscle mass. So in a time-dependent dynamic fashion, we're trying to understand on day two, day four, day six, what are the decision points which leads an animal to lose skeletal muscle mass. And we're doing that using numerous uh, metabolic measurements and uh, gene expression measurements. But to cut a long story short, what we have found is that even though you lose muscle mass only on day 10 or 14, by day six, there is a major decrease in oxidative phosphorylation mitochondrial genes, which is leading us to, uh, like I said, we're trying to find this decision at which the muscle decided to lose skeletal muscle mass and what were the decisions along the way? And if we know the early decisions that went into making that uh, loss of skeletal muscle mass, can we go target that? So just using tr transcriptional profiles, we have found that maybe one of the earliest decisions that is being made is a decrease in mitochondrial metabolism, telling us that there are signals coming, hypothesizing that there are signals coming from the mitochondria, which might be telling a skeletal muscle that, listen, keep your mass. And if you lose this signal, maybe you go down this cascade of losing skeletal muscle mass. And we are in the process of dissecting the small molecules, mitochondrial derived small molecules that let's say we might fool the muscle into maintaining skeletal muscle mass, though it is uh, not being used. So again, the future directions here, as you can imagine, is now we are finding these small molecules that we might think might prevent skeletal muscle mass uh, loss uh, during disuse. And whether if we can add those back into these mice, whether we can even though they're disusing their limbs can prevent muscle uh, wastage, which I think could have an immense impact on all kinds of diseases, including, of course, as we age and we lose skeletal muscle mass, or if you're uh, in a hospital, stuck in a hospital somewhere and unable to use your limb. So uh, just to leave you that we are not just working with mice. Uh, we know this happens as you age. It's called sarcopenia. Whether you like it or not, after the age of 50, we start losing about 1% of skeletal muscle mass. We can try to put it off with some weight training, resistance training, but it's almost inevitable uh, to start losing muscle mass. And losing skeletal muscle mass has an immediate impact on balance, on frailty. Uh, as I told you, skeletal muscle is the major sink of glucose. So if you don't have enough skeletal muscle, you start developing other metabolic diseases like diabetes, fatty liver, and all of that. 
So our goal is that if we find signals that will drive a muscle to lose its mass and function, either by just by aging or by liver mobilization, we could use these kinds of uh, this kind of an understanding to understand these nutrient signals to stop this. So um, very quickly, um, we are. It's this is not a pipe dream. Uh, this is a pay, pay, uh, res, something came out last month where they have started finding compounds that seem to be associated. This NAD, which I told you, which is synthesized from the mitochondria, that seems to be abundance of that molecule seems to be negatively associated, positively associated, or let's say if you don't have enough of the skeletal mass of this molecule, uh, there seems to be a major decrease in skeletal muscle mass, telling us that yes, we are on the right track. There are these mitochondrial derived compounds, which might actually be uh, playing a role in terms of losing skeletal muscle mass and function as you age. Now, whether you can treat that back and prevent it, we don't know. That is something we plan to do, uh, which is, uh, I, we just started this uh, national start opinion frailty group, uh, which will hopefully become a society next year, where we really want to drive fundraising and research and so on in this clinical study of sarcopenia. So this is some of my colleagues in the Baptist Hospital with this foundation called Vayavikas by Chris Gopal Krishnan and a couple of other healthcare providers where we are start doing a clinical study. We are taking, you know, it's amazing. There are some aged people who don't lose skeletal muscle mass and they do just fine. Uh, they're not that many, but then there are aged people who lose skeletal muscle mass quite rapidly. So we are trying to find these cohorts as people come into the clinic to take their blood and really try to understand these metabolic markers, which will help to predict either nutrients or uh, different kinds of inflammatory molecules, even the microbiome actually, which I didn't talk about, uh, which might be predictors or modifiers of sarcopenia. So that is something we're excited about that we're moving forward with. So with that, I just wanted to thank my laboratory at Instem, And uh, these are people who do all the hard work. And this company called MitoPower, who is uh, really supplying us with many of these drug-like molecules, which we hope to be testing in the near future. Thanks. Thank you, Arvind, for this nice talk. Uh, we had questions during the talk, so more questions. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, hi, Arvind. Uh, wonderful talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, and all the graphics and everything. Yeah, I think. glad you enjoyed that. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to the book. Uh, oh, uh, so, uh, is, uh, so in the second part when you mentioned um, this RBM three and how uh, uh, it uh, increase, uh, you can sort of. Uh, by expressing it, I guess, if I understood, uh, by expressing it, you can uh, mimic the effects of uh, hypothermia yes. uh, yeah. and increase the basal metabolism rate. Uh, 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 is there a way, so sort of two questions, uh, is basal metabolism rate also expressed by, I mean, are there some genes which, uh, because some people have yeah. intrinsically higher meta basal metabolism rate, some people have a lower one. Are there, sp uh, is the genetic basis yeah. of the basal metabolism rate understood? Yeah. Would that be a pathway to understand, uh, just like you mentioned in the first part of the talk about the IGF-1, mm -hmm. uh, could there be something similar here where, uh, just like there were people, centenarians who, uh, uh, had uh, this uh, genetic uh, marker. Uh, for, um, could there be something like that in terms of the basal metabolism rate? Uh, I think you ask a very good question. People have talked about this, what the rate of living or whatever it is. You're absolutely correct. What is basal metabolism in the end? You know, mm -hmm. what is it? It is essentially how much, I'm going to say how much VO2 max, how much oxygen you're able to take up, how much glucose you're able to take up and generate heat, which is essentially how much glucose your skeletal muscle is able to take up and generate heat to keep your core temperature high and uh, all of that. So um, I, I, under normal circumstances, there's one question and what happens at hypothermia is another. So right, right, if, right. under hypothermia, you're decreasing your basal metabolism dramatically. Right. And, but still you have to keep it at a certain threshold so that you don't die. So that's so, why the RBM3 kicks yes, in. So we there. think you, when you take, take your core temperature where you're going to die, there has to be a certain compensatory mechanism that keeps it at the enough of a level that you are able to 
uh, right. survive. But you raise a very good point because now we took what was happening in the cold and now took cells that are in normal 37, your normal right. basal, right. and we raised that above the basal. Exactly. So is so, there a genetic thing which uh, like ex enhances RBM3, for instance? Uh, 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 Oh, I don't know. You know, I've been fascinated by this protein, as you can tell. What happens is this protein seems to be translate, uh, transcribed throughout, even at any temperature. It's, if you measure the RNA levels, usually it's about the same in any temperature. It's only at a cold temperature it gets translated. And that seems to have to do with the secondary structure of the RNA. At a certain temperature, it takes on a secondary structure that's now able to, in uh -huh. an interesting way, bind to the ribosome and translate. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the gen so the, so RBM three that's one thing it is not genetically controlled but rather controlled okay. by, by uh, secondary the, structure. Okay. But what controls basal metabolism are their genes. Now I think uh, basal metabolism. Um, I can take a guess for a few things. Uh, the major drivers of basal metabolism is um, is mitochondria. Let's say okay. Mostly, if you have muscles with a lot of mitochondria, they're going to be taking up a lot of glucose and cons consume oxygen and increase your basal metabolism. That there are specific pathways actually controlled by mTOR, uh, but there are specific transcription factors called PGC1 alpha and other things like PPARs, uh, PPR deltas, and so on. So there are genetic pathways that can regulate basal metabolism. And in fact, you can take mice and express these genes and it's increase the basal metabolism that way. I see. So there are genetic ways of doing this. Hmm. And do that, does that lead to increased uh, lifespan uh, or uh, not Good. necessarily? Uh, you know, lifespan as such in la higher animals has not been done that much. It's just too hard, I guess. Two years to do, it takes a lot of money and time. Um, hmm. What often people do nowadays is that they take these uh, um, accelerated aging mice, you know, with the lamin knockout and so on, and they do studies there. But whether I don't, I think increasing maximum lifespan in a mouse is in a mammal is extremely difficult. They can increase, they compress the morbidity, they can increase the average lifespan, but maximum lifespan I don't think changes easily. It seems to be a pretty hard bottleneck. Uh, and if you increase basal metabolism, I am not aware of whether it does anything to. Uh, lifespan at this point. It certainly helps with disposing of glucose. People have studied all of this in the context of diabetes, which is where it's been studied, because you're unable to now have uh, at least a productive basal metabolism in terms of taking up glucose and fat. By doing this, you're able to switch your fuel from no, fuel to take up glucose. So it's been studied in that context, but I think uh, as far as I know, uh, I'm not aware of what it does in lifespan. Thanks. I think there is a question uh, online by Srinivas Prabhu. You yeah. can read it uh, or I can read it out for you. Sure. you... Oh, I can. Okay. Uh, shall I read it out? You can read yeah. it out. Yeah. You are okay. not. So, uh, hi everyone. Thank you for the beautiful talk, uh, Arvind. I have a quick question. Could you, uh, could the mechanosensing by the cells affect the metabolic rewiring uh, of these hibernating animals? And mm -hmm. then there is a next, uh, another part. And could there be a mechanosensitive switch for the decision making to lose skeletal uh, muscle? Because there, because that can be reversible. Now, these are all beautiful questions. I, I feel mechanobiology is really at the forefront, you know, where the biology is at. We are just getting a feel for what happens in cells. You know, there's some beautiful talks you have heard. Measuring mechano, I mean, there is actually a beautiful paper just last week where there is a, a molecular sensor of uh, mechanical stress called piezo, I think it's called. And they have shown that a piezo expression plays a dramatic role in terms of stem cell uh, development. So that's one of the first papers I've seen in vivo where you're absolutely, your thought is absolutely correct. That I think there is also huge, I mean, you're really asking questions at the forefront of the aging field. People do think that it is known that your ECM composition and actually your tissue stiffness and all does change with aging. And it, it is not far-fetched at all. Actually, as a matter of fact, it is from in vitro experiments, it is pretty clear that 
the mechanical environment of a cell has a tremendous impact, not just on proliferation and differentiation, but also its metabolism. And as you know, the people who have studied this to the greatest extent are the cancer people, because for them, they have thought in terms of uh, uh, metastasis and so on, right? You have a, a cancer cell in one tissue that now needs to metastasize and move somewhere else, and losing any kind of a mechanical signal changes metabolism. So we know there is a clear, at least in cancer cells, a clear correlation between uh, mechanical signals and metabolism. And we know that mechanical stresses do change with aging. And we know that uh, certainly stem cells from skeletal muscle use mechanical sensing to regenerate tissue. So putting all of that together, I think you're absolutely correct, but I don't have one experiment right now or one paper that tells all of these in one story. Yeah. Uh, so there is another question by Charuha Sini uh, Kulkarni. Sorry if I am spelling, uh, I'm pronouncing your name wrong. But the uh, question is that are there any trade offs of the increased lifespan? And uh, the follow up is are there any consequences, behavioral or other, on the organism on which the lifespan mm-hmm. has been increased by drugs or calorific deficit? or genetic manipulation. Absolutely correct. I mean, I, I was in California for numerous years and trust me, there are people who don't hesitate. They see something in a worm and they think I'll do that too. And uh, so calorie, So you have a lot of people who are emaciated, who hardly have anything. Maybe they live long. We certainly know in worms, huh? if you put worms on CR or decrease mTOR, they, are, they cannot reproduce. So you live very long, but you're, you have fecundity in terms of not able to have offsprings. Now, that's as far as a species goes, unacceptable right so you can increase lifespan but you don't reproduce so that is a real consequence there um that's what i've seen experimentally in worms and so on uh, and certainly in people when they look that emaciated i don't think anybody wants to reproduce with them um but um apart from that let's see genetic manipulations so that is the main thing i have seen i have seen uh, i'm most of my knowledge comes from worms and uh, other uh, smaller animals because that's where lifespan has really been done at the level at which you can say something. Um, there are these, I've seen worms that live four times the average. Okay, really four times as long, but they are much smaller. They look a lot sicker. So you're absolutely correct. There is a consequence. I think there are some fitness trade-offs when it comes to lifespan. And uh, certainly with the, I know for sure fecundity is one of those trade-offs, yeah. Okay, so more, more questions. I think uh, Anupam Ghosh has a question. Anupam, yeah, you... yeah. So my question is about uh, the slide that you had shown that the muscle composition of a marathon runner and a, say a sprinter is different. Hmm. So uh, out of these two types, uh, which one is better off uh, in terms of uh, preventing this uh, age-related uh, degeneration of muscles? Fantastic question. Um, wow, that's something that we have really wanted to ask, haven't gotten great answers for. We know you lose skeletal muscle mass and people have often asked, okay, but which fiber do you lose? Do you use the mitochondrial fiber or do you use the glycolytic? Uh, do you use, lose the marathon runner fiber or do you lose the, the other fiber? Now, in, in our mouse models where we use uh, disuse atrophy, where you start losing muscle mass, it seems like over time you lose both, okay? But it seems like the first thing, at least, see, um, it depends on the muscle type also. Uh, not all your muscles have all of those fibers. Usually your load-bearing muscles, like your, in, in case of mice, it might be different, but certainly in our case, you know, the, the gastrocnemius or the, the you know, uh, those large uh, posterior chain muscles uh, are usually uh, type two, which is essentially they are bearing your weight. As, as a matter of fact, I think most of your load-bearing muscles, uh, like things that are holding up your posture, like your, your chest muscles and so on, they are not uh, the marathon runner type. They are the type 2, which is much more glycolytic. Uh, the marathon runner fibers are the ones that are doing, of course, doing a lot of the work, which is essentially your leg muscles, your calf muscles, and your quadriceps and so on. So um, I think the answer to your question will depend on what muscle you look at. But there are muscles which are mixed fiber types, which is what we look at, which have both these types. And we have found that finally, when you have atrophy, both of these fibers seems to be lost. 
but the uh, the first fiber that seems to go seems to be the type 2 not the mitochondria not the marathon runner type 1 but rather the type 2 but that's just what i have done in mice uh, and as we do more human studies uh, we know a bit more uh, more questions uh, i can ask if uh, uh, sure uh, uh, so, um, I mean, uh, maybe you touched upon it, but um, um, uh, th there's uh, neurodegeneration also, I mean, uh, with aging, uh, the yeah. Alzheimer's and other. Uh, this, is that uh, correlated with uh, the other kinds of degeneration or, or is it that you might be able to enhance lifespan, but not? Uh, but it may not be correlated at all with the uh, neural degeneration. Uh, <laughs> I think it would depend on the disease. Um, I think so. For instance, we know Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and so on have specific etiologies for the disease, right? Which would be specific mutations and so on. In that case, um, I am not so sure. But if the hypothesis is Aging, this is a hypothesis, one of the hypotheses we're working on when it comes to even your regeneration, that aging can be looked at as a loss of homeostasis. And homeostasis when it comes to metabolism, your fuel intake, and homeostasis when it comes to how you deal with your proteins and your protein turnover. Hmm. And that phenomenon seems to be the same whether it comes to muscle degeneration to some extent, certainly when it comes to neuro neurodegeneration where there's an accumulation, as you know, of misfolded proteins, and there is a loss of protein recycling. And many people have actually, there are some major drugs which will come on the market soon, whose major target is going to be some of these proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum, which are going to force your uh, proteins to be turned over. So if the hypothesis is aging is a loss of protein turnover homeostasis, I think they could be a, uh, a the same across tissues. But I think there are specific, there might be specific age-related diseases where this might not be true, like I said, Parkinson's or prion diseases and so on. I see. Uh -huh. Okay. Any more question? Okay. Anupam, uh, maybe one more. And yeah. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. For yeah. So yeah. I had a similar question uh, about uh, sleep. So, uh, as people age, uh, what I've heard is they tend to have less sleep. Yeah. And um, also, I was listening to a podcast where they said that if uh, animals were deprived of sleep, then their average lifespan uh, was reduced. Mm. And something like uh, these ROS got formed in their gut and that uh, had some effect uh, on the lifespan. So, I just wanted to know uh, how if any effect uh, sleep has on the lifespan? No, that is clearly not my area of expert, but I'm going to expertise, but I'm going to try to uh, extrapolate on a few things that I have done. We know circadian rhythms, cellular circadian rhythms in skeletal muscle and other have an immense impact on protein turnover and behavior of cells. Uh, I mean, as you know, there is, even though you have a skeletal muscle cell, it actually, there's a diurnal sort of a, uh, oscillation of proteins autonomously. So clearly this sort of a periodicity in terms of uh, response to the light or whatever it may be is critically important for cells. Because we know that if you remove clock proteins and all of these things, uh, stem cells do not behave appropriately. They don't differentiate. So on a cellular level, we know this sort of a cycling is important. So why is it? It will be completely unsurprising to me if on an organismal level, we changed the cycling and it would not have a deleterious impact. So I have no doubt on that. And um, I don't know anything about sleep. It's a fascinating area. But there is this colleague at UCSF who studies, but there is this mutation, I forgot. There's a paper in Cell a few years ago where there are human beings who sleep only three, four hours, you know, and they do just fine. And most of us, of course, need eight or so. Uh, so um, I think there was some mechanism, I mean, trying to understand what sleep does, but one of the things I know sleep does apparently is pruning of neurons and protein turnover, a lot of your learning, your consolidation of your uh, uh, <clears throat> for memory in skeletal muscle and all happens during sleep. Uh, so I would think that disrupting that would have deleterious consequences generally on, I mean, I don't know if directly on lifespan, but certainly on physiology that would affect lifespan, wouldn't it? Yeah.
Okay, any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Arvind once more for the very the nice talk and thank you, Arvind. Thank you, pleasure. Thanks for having me.